thank you, Steve. I'm delighted to uh, receive this award. Uh, it's, a, it's a great honor. There are many people here that I know, Ed Taylor, many other people from MIT who've gotten this award, and I'm happy to join their ranks. What I'd like to talk to you about today is the TEAL program, which was uh, a five or six year program, and by design, a five or six year program to change the format of introductory physics at MIT. And I'll also discuss more recent uh, innovations. TEAL is constantly changing. It's been changing since it was introduced in 2002. And we, we now have put in a significant online component. I'd just like to explain where that is going. So that's how I'll end up my talk. So there were three central people in having this come about. As you'll see, I spent a lot of money. There were a lot of resources. There were a cast of hundreds involved in developing Teal. I'll explain that more as we go on. But these three people were the central people, and I'll explain why. I'll give you a little history of Teal, which is also known as scale-up. And Teal is totally derivative of scale-up, just to make sure everyone understands that. The Teal classrooms, why did we do this? As I say, this was a major effort. What prompted that? You never see a change at an institution like MIT of this magnitude without some real underlying cause, and I'd just like to explain what that cause was. Then I'd like to move on to the more recent uh, incarnations, MOOCs and blended learning. Of course, Teal is blended learning, or Teal is flipped, and, but that's the more uh, popular buzzword. I'd like to talk about 801X and 802X. These are now courses offered to the world with 30,000 initial registrants and 1,700 people getting a certificate. This is through edX. And we did that, and we um, brought that back into residential to use the edX platform to serve uh, on-campus uh, residential. Courses. And I'll explain why I think that's important to the future of this kind of interaction. And finally, I'll talk about uh, lessons learned. So the three central people, uh, Lori Breslow, who is a senior lecturer in the Sloan School of Management, founding director emeritus of the MIE Teaching and Learning Laboratory. She's also my wife. We were married on Saturday, October 3rd, 1999. Let me quote Laurie. <laughs> She's made a, a great sacrifice for MIT education. <laughs> She's a humanist, and I am a typical physics nerd. So it's a very strange combination, but it's worked. And she taught me everything I know about education. Uh, on Monday, October 5th, we were both invited to a small meeting in the MIT Provost Office announcing the MIT Microsoft iCampus initiative. Let me just, <laughs> just note that we postponed our honeymoon. Actually, I don't think we ever took a honeymoon so that we could come to this meeting two days after we were married. So that shows the level of compulsion. <laughs> and Laurie has written a very nice article on the history of Teal that I will not be able to come anywhere near, which is in Change Magazine. And I would recommend that article. It gives a lot of detail that I won't go into. Peter Damaschian was a central figure in all this. He's a lecturer in the physics department. He's a co-leader of the Teal Initiative. We lived through the first tumultuous years of Teal, and I'll describe why they were tumultuous in a minute. 
And also, we're very successful now. We're seen as the way to do education at MIT. We're held up as the paragon of virtue. But believe me, it didn't start out that way. And Thiel would not exist and would not have survived without uh, Peter Damaschkin. So he was fully responsible for what we did and an incredibly important player in this. Another important player was Judy Dory, who was on sabbatical when the money came available to make the proposal to do Teal. She's the Dean of the Faculty of Education in Science and Technology at the Technion. She does assessment. She was the leader of the Teal assessment effort. And based on her work, we could say, we know the students don't like Teal, but they're learning twice as much. And believe me, at one point, that saved us because we got a very negative reaction from the students when we started this. So let me tell you a little bit about the classrooms. Uh, this is a 3D rendering of um, the first Teal classroom. We have two of these. These are modeled after North Carolina State's classroom. Actually, we had Bob Beekner come up and uh, also, Karen Cummings, who was doing uh, studio physics at RPI in those days, to advisors on designing the classroom, because we built this from scratch in an existing space. Lots of things that, uh, actually, let me go over here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Lots of things about this uh, classroom. We have a room for equipment, which we bring out for the desktop experiments. Uh, there are lots of whiteboards, so students can do interactive um, things. And I'll show you a video of that. Uh, no central uh, front to the room. There's a station here that we use to do various things, but the instructors uh, ideally walk around and do not stay at that central lectern. I'm going to show you a video, oh, courtesy of uh, Saif Rayan, who's put this together. It has many MIT freshmen in it, all of whom have signed releases. I've got the chair of the MIT faculty, Krishna Raja Gopal, teaching in it. He's a physicist. Peter, many undergraduate TAs, which are very important in our implementation, and Peter's idea and a graduate TAs, and we have a technical services group members who keep the computers running and, the, uh, and help with the various technical issues. So that's the best part of Teal. You can stand up and go home now. I'm going to ask you to get your clickers out and try your hand at this concept question. Yes. OK, so um, the most popular answer only has 50% of you. So please discuss among yourselves. And then if you would like to re-answer, re go ahead. Well, I mean, if, if the charge has like an initial loss, then it would have fallen. <laughs> This is an undergraduate TA, a student who's taken the course and has been recruited to help If you were to, to take your hand classroom. as an arrow, and you're the point, which way would you point to get the Earth's magnetic field in this room? OK, that's great. Your discussions, you're now at 93% on the right answer. So by talking to each other, you went from 50% right answer to 94% right answer. So what we're going to do next is have you do a problem, which I'm going to put up on the slides. And you're going to go to the whiteboards in groups of three and do the following problem. These are all students working in groups of three with uh, instructors coming around. And Again, this is Christian Raja Gopal. Oh, 
when I'm looking around the room, what I'm looking for on the boards, first off, having a diagram makes a ton of difference. And when I look at your diagrams, I'm trying to see where the vectors are on the diagram, just to make sure everything is done right. Um, I see right answers, um, but I don't always see diagrams. And what we're trying to do here is setting up the basic skill. This is skill number one. This is a really nice solution right here. I don't know which, I guess it was a group sitting somewhere near here. The, the first thing to realize is This is a student is that done problem that Krishna is, is talking to. In the i-hat direction. There, do you see the lightning bolt? By um, dumping that charge through a little minor lightning bolt into the ground, and it's getting to the ground through this. Like charge, you can think of this as being the analog of what we did last time, rubbing fur on the plastic. And as I start to charge that, you notice the little grass seeds lining up. What we have here is a um, Kelvin water drop experiment. This is a clever way, due to Lord Kelvin, of generating a potential difference between these two little balls here. And what's your name? Jonathan. Jonathan just heard a spark. I don't know if the rest of you could hear a spark. Um, if you, if what you see is that the external charge has induced a charge separation within the conductor. Okay? Um, and all the blue charges are crowded over near the external charge and all the orange charges are pushed far away from it. And if we look at the electric field right there, what you see is that many of the field lines from that external charge end on the blue charges. And then on the far side, there are new field lines starting from the orange charges going, um, going outwards. So that's the best representation of what we do. Believe me, it has evolved enormously since we first started doing it. When we first started doing it, we had a lot of lecturing and not very much interaction. And this has evolved over the years to as much interaction as we can put into it and get the faculty to take up. A course like this, we'll have 800 students and we'll have nine different faculty doing sessions, uh, sections. Uh, but it's all very tightly choreographed by Peter Damashkin as to what happens in each session. There are lots of uh, applets and visualizations which I put a lot of time into because that's my personal interest and uh, you can take a look at some of those on the, that website. This material is freely available and has a very liberal open uh, source license. The timeline for all this it was in about to 2000, I proposed a five-year plan, uh, and we followed that five-year plan. I think it actually took us six years. I knew it was going to take a long time, so that's why I put in a five-year plan. This is not something you do in a semester or in a year. We did two prototypes. Then in spring 2003, we went to the large scale. The fall of 2003, we started mechanics. First, we did electromagnetism. Uh, then we scaled up mechanics to the large scale. And currently, from 2012 to now, we're, we continually modify the teal, and we're also adding uh, more online resources. Let me just address the question of why did we do this. Uh, the reason was the failure rate in freshman physics. It was two to three times higher than in other general institute courses, chemistry, biology, math, and that was known as the physics problem. That had been around for a long time and a number of pressures on the department to change that, all the way from the MIT corporation. And also the physics faculty were frustrated. We had very low attendance in these large freshman lectures, even with the best of lecturers. And in, in particular, a lot of faculty were frustrated by the fact that we did not have, in, in 1999, we had not had a laboratory in the mainline physics courses for 30 years. We simply did not have a lab. And I could go into some of the reasons for that, but that was, in fact, what the situation was in 1999. 
So that is the impetus. The opportunity was uh, MIT had $35 million that was dedicated to education in the early, in 1999. They're not endowment gifts. They wanted to spend that money in five to seven years. Britt and Alex Darbeloff were one of the sources of those uh, monies. Uh, Darbeloff was then the chair of the MIT Corporation. So I was spending the chair of the MIT Corporation's money. He was very interested in improving the freshman year because he was an MIT alumnus. And he once asked me, why do you make these people take physics? Because he was an engineer and he didn't appreciate 801 or 802. <laughs> but he was very instrumental and very uh, magnanimous toward this program and very interested in improving the freshman year experience. Also, MITI campus put a substantial amount of money into this, and the sum total of these monies was $35 million. It was openly competed to MIT faculty, and I proposed a five-year plan to introduce interactive learning. Because I had been to North Carolina State, I had sat in a scale-up classroom, and I had a religious experience. So that was the one, it was Bob Beekner's example that uh, inspired me to do this. In addition, the head and the associate head of the physics department were behind this. They were interested in trying interactive pedagogy. Everybody had heard about studio physics scale up. It was, it was very well known. I was leading, willing to lead the effort. Uh, Peter was available and a, known as a wonderful educator. Uh, the vice, then vice president for MIT for research, Dave Litster, who's a physicist and experimentalist, was also very interested in developing uh, desktop experiments for the course. And the dean of undergraduate education at that time, by Bob Breadwine, also a physicist, was an enthusiastic supporter. So we had money and we had support and a motivation and that support went all the way up to the MIT Corporation. So when we implemented it, we followed scale up in studio physics and a large dose of peer instruction. We taught it twice to prototype in uh, 150 students. Peter and I did that. That was very well received by the students. The tech, the student newspaper, said we were a success in the prototype and that we were going to expand. Unfortunately, that favorable student reaction uh, went away in the spring of 2003 when we went to the large 800 student courses. We had a lot of faculty teaching who had never taught in this format before and we did a poor job of training them to teach in this format. So then the student reaction And it's not many of you who can pick the day of your academic career, which was the lowest day of your career. But for me, it was Friday, March 21, 2003. I was very exposed on this. I had spent a lot of money. I had the chair of the corporation behind me. And the students did not agree. They thought this was terrible. So, and, and we recovered from this, but it, it was the reason we recovered is the importance of assessment. We had resources to have a full-time assessment professional. Judy was on sabbatical. We had been doing assessment since we started in the prototype courses. We had a solid assessment showing a factor of two. Increase in learning games, and that's comparing MIT students and lecture recitation to MIT students in Teal with the same demographics, the same term. So it was apples compared to apples. And because of the startup problems, if we had not had that assessment, I really think this entire effort would have foundered because otherwise it would just be, you're doing a really stupid thing, let's stop doing it. But I had a lot of support and they gave us the opportunity to fix the startup problems the current popularity of the course, if you ask students if they like it, 
is the same as in pre-teal days, and the failure rates are comparable to the other General Institute requirements. And that was the goal. There was a very specific goal involved in this, and, and we have done that. So that's uh, TEAL, and it, TEAL is a continuing to be a work in progress. Uh, let me talk about uh, more recent things, MOOCs and blended learning. Again, TEAL is blended learning. Scale up is blended learning. It is flipped. So I'm just using the local uh, current buzzwords. So uh, in 2012, MIT with Harvard set up edX is a nonprofit corporation. It's not part of MIT. It's a standalone nonprofit to offer courses to the world in the MOOC format. This is from the edX uh, web page. There was a huge phenomena in 2012. I'm sure you, you didn't. This, this didn't go past without your notice. And there's a lot of, a lot of expectations and uh, a lot of expectations that are tempered by reality now. But nonetheless, it's, it was a huge phenomenon. At MIT, we decided to get involved in this. And we offered uh, 801X and 802X. Now, the X means that this is a course offered to the world, not to MIT residential students but based on our 801 and 802 in the spring of 2013 and the fall of 2013. And that motivation was from the then department head, Ed Birchinger, who wanted to build online edX courses in physics for the world. And that was a, an altruistic motivation. We got involved in this for altruistic motives. I was a project leader. Uh, Deepto Chakrabarty it was involved in mechanics, and we were, we were the figureheads, and Saif Aryan, who's sitting in the audience, did all the work with a cast of thousands underneath him. Again, this was a well-funded effort. And the MOOCs were well-received. Uh, we had 30,000 original registrants in both 801X and 802X, and about 1,700 certificates, and the course reviews were quite favorable. And in doing this, the department gained a lot of experience uh, with the edX platform and influenced the design of the edX platform. And that was one of our reasons to get involved, because we did want to influence the design of the edX platform. The ultimate goal was to use the experience we had with MOOCs to improve residential 801 and 802. Uh, using the edX platform to deliver online resources. And indeed, we came back in the spring of 2014 and incorporated the edX platform into the residential course. Now we're back to classes of 800. Let me just note the timeline. We did, in the spring and fall, two courses each have started out with 30,000 students, each of which gave 1,700 certificates. This was an enormous amount of work, just an enormous amount of work. And then we turned around in the spring of 2014 and brought that back into residential. The reason that worked was Saif Rayan who's sitting in the row here, and I, I'm glad that he's sitting there because I wasn't sure in the spring of 2014 he was going to live through the end of that offering. <laughs> I think he slept for four hours a day, something like that. Luckily, at that point, I was very senior. I'm very old. I'm 72. So at that point, I just get to say, you do that, you do that, you do that, and then go to bed at 9 o'clock. But safe, <laughs> safe didn't have that option. So that's what we did. We're, we're using the edX platform to pre present uh, content outside of class. Uh, Lori was involved in 
formative assessment to help strengthen the connection between the edX courses, which are open to the world, and the on-campus residential courses. And in particular, the question we're asking, and many question, people are asking and will be asked for the next 10 or 20 years, is what online resources help students best, if most effectively, with the face-to-face -face instruction. Uh, there, there are a number of elements. I'm not going to get into these, other than I'd like to point out that uh, Charlie Holbrow was working night and day. His wife, Mary, complained to me about what have I done to Charlie. He's, he doesn't have any time to anything to do but put stuff on a MOOC. But uh, again, this was all led by SAFE. Uh, and uh, if you see him after the talk, walk up and shake his hand that he lived through all this. So this was extremely well received by MIT students. One of the reasons was that I had really royally screwed up 11 years before this. I did not want another article in the student newspaper saying, oh my god, John Belcher has done it again. I got students involved in every level of this. I had them advising on a, a, how to put the content online. They were student leaders. I paid attention to what the students wanted. I wasn't even so interested in what the learning gains were. I just did not want the students to not like this. So in fact, they liked it. There's an article by Safe and I in the faculty newsletter saying that they liked it. Let me just give you one indication. We asked them the question, should 802 continue to use MITx? That's, a, that's edX inside MIT. And the answer was 95% yes. You who've taught know that you never get a positive 95% reaction. That never happens. But it happened in this case because we were so careful to do what we thought the students would like, and, and we succeeded in doing that. I also think what we did was pedagogically very useful, but I didn't want another petition. I had already had a petition. So uh, that's a little history of what we've gone through. Um, in particular, this is a continuing process. Uh, I was in a scale-up discussion yesterday morning, and someone in the room uh, said, who started scale-up in 2002, said, I wish they'd told me it was going to be a 13-year process. And indeed, I think this is going to be another 13 years of experimenting with the online component to make it work with the blended component. So this is nowhere near finished. And let me just tell you uh, the lessons we've learned from all this. The first one is institutional change is really difficult. There's an enormous amount of inertia in the way we teach. And even if you have abundant resources, and believe me, Every time I asked for more money, I got more money. I don't, know, I don't know of any other situation in education except that moment at MIT at that time, which you remember was the start of the dot-com boom where the money was flowing so freely because MIT was really worried about the competition with online courses, and still is, I might add. And I had support all the way from the chair of the corporation through the president, through the provost, who was Bob Brown, now at Boston University, through the dean of undergraduate education, through the department heads. Every one of those people supported me. And indeed, they supported me when we got such a negative reaction in the spring of 2003. They gave us time to get the bugs out. But that was also due to the fact that we could demonstrate that there were really great learning gains involved. So that's why I have number two, is assessment is really important. 
because otherwise it's just anecdotal. Every physicist who's ever stood in front of a chalkboard with a piece of chalk in his hand is an expert in education. Not that they believe the studies I've done, but it gives some credence to them. And I, th I think I'm a convert. I know people will still argue about this. I still argue about this with some of my very esteemed colleagues, the fellow who's going to win a Nobel Prize next in the physics department. We have discussions about this. But from the instant I sat in um, Bob Beekner's classroom and observed students actually discussing an experiment that they were trying to do, I, I was converted that you really need to listen to students, you need to interact with them, that if you just talk to them as I'm talking to you, they will not learn much. And it's much more effective to have this kind of interaction with them. So I think the looking forward, the challenge of the future is how to take these blended flip classes, put in a substantial online component, that effectively frees up more time for face-to-face. -face. I, I think that's the goal we should be looking for. And the word is effectively how to do that is not really clear to anybody. I think there's an enormous amount of data gathered in online platforms that will help in this effectiveness. And in particular, let me give you an advertisement for a talk of the kinds of studies that are ongoing, uh, both at MIT and other places. This is a talk this afternoon at 440, which talks about using the enormous amount of clickstream data we have from using the edX platform to try to understand what students are doing. And in particular, I'm not gonna go into this, but we have a record when a student is on the online platform of every click, the time of every click, and where they were going to in the course material. Whether they're going to the online textbook, or videos, or homework tutorials, so that you have an enormous amount of data to analyze as to exactly what the students are using, and what is effective and what is not. And this is a, uh, a figure from a, uh, a student of Jennifer DeBoer, who's just, and she will be talking about this work this afternoon. The other thing I'd like to point out is we're continuing to improve the technology. There's a huge amount of technology involved in doing these. SAFE and Peter are working on yet another uh, MOOC in 801 and 802. And they're focusing now on, instead of using 50-minute lectures, for our first MOOC, we had pre-recorded lectures of a famous lecturer, and we went with that. Even though pedagogically, that's not the way to go, we were very time-limited. What SAFE and Peter and associated people uh, are doing now is to make short videos, and let me just show you an example of that. So let's begin by choosing a coordinate system, and let's look at an object that's moving with respect to this coordinate system. We have an origin, we have axes plus x and plus y, and we can refer to this as a reference frame. We'll call the relationship that Ra equals the vector r, and I'm going to keep that time dependence there, plus the vector rb. This type of relationship is what we call a coordinate transformation between the two reference frames A and B. Now, if we wanted to describe these vectors in Cartesian coordinates and look at what happens in dependent times, we may want to find RB in terms of RA, and so it's very simple to rewrite this equation as RA minus R of T. And that's what's meant by a coordinate transformation between two reference frames, A and B, which are moving relative to each other. Your immediate reaction to that, it was probably mine. My God, Peter's really smart. He can write backwards. <laughs> and I'll let you work out how this works, but he doesn't write backwards. <laughs> 
so the emphasis is to going to short videos that uh, address a particular topic that are linked in, uh, and to track the use of these videos uh, using the edX platform to see what students are using, when they're using it, uh, and, and so on. So we get an enormous amount of data from this, and uh, you can analyze that to see what's effective. And let me advertise another talk. Michelle Tomasek, Peter, and James Kane have a talk on producing these kind of videos, which they're currently doing. That's this afternoon at uh, 3.50. So the lessons learned, let me just come back to the really important lesson um, about the challenge of the future. I think the challenge of the future is to take this enormous investment that people are making in online technology and see how to use it effectively in pedagogy. And I think that will occupy us for another 10 or 15 years. So that's my talk, and I thank you for listening. My feel for that is MIT students are not that different from your students. I know there's a great, we tell ourselves that we have the best and brightest, and 10% of our students are the best and brightest. The others put their pants on one leg at a time, just like I do. And I, let me think of what is the female equivalent of that. They, uh, I don't mean to be sexist, but they're not, they work very hard, but there are a lot of challenges with MIC students. In particular, the backgrounds, are, that's a huge range of backgrounds. I would guarantee you that we have the same range of backgrounds. Well, I won't guarantee you. We have a huge range of backgrounds. But I think that is a problem. I think that's a problem in MIT putting an online course because it's designed at the MIT level and it's not necessarily something that's going to work for 30,000 people. I'm sorry, small groups? When we started out, we uh, self-select, I mean, we, we set, selected to be heterogeneous. We would put low, middle, high. We were careful about race and gender. Uh, in recent years, we have gone away from that. And I could tell you why we did that. Uh, but with 800 students, it's actually very hard to group them. It was a huge, major thing at the beginning of the term. Nonetheless, they do sit in groups. We let those students stay in the groups for the entire term, so they'll be a group of three, and we let them self-select. And that seems to be working. That's not. Uh, it now is on? Thank you. Uh, would you see the use of edX materials without an association to classroom, but in a credential form, since most students want a credential, as leading to a very wide uh, revolution in how many minds we can educate? The question, I think, is purely online, is it going to lead to a revolution? Am I stating the question correctly? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to answer that question. My prejudice is it will not. But uh, I'm also somebody who wanted to keep my punched cards and I didn't want to let them go. <laughs> so I'm not sure I predict the future very well. I, I just simply think that uh, this is an enormous amount of work to offer a good online course. 801X and 802X were good online courses. The people who got certificates learned a lot of physics. But it came at an enormous cost to active faculty members and instructors in the physics department. And I do not see that that is sustainable. And I think if you just turn around and put that same course online without modifying it, 
within two days, you will be able to go to the web and find the solutions to all the tests and all the problems. So there is a question of who is doing the work. There are just lots of issues, and I can't quite see how that is going to go. So I, my, I, I don't know. With that, let's uh, thank our speaker again.